Welcome to the second part of this topic. We're addressing those who are void of the spirit, but full of demons. Void of the spirit, but full of words and demons. Welcome back. Thank you for waiting. Of course, I can apologize for the network that I have, but <laughs> we use what is available to us. Am I clear? Is this better? Is this better? Is the streaming perfect now? Are you hearing me clearly? Is the video uh, uh, fluid? Perfect. Okay. We Matthew twelve thirty four. Matthew twelve thirty four. And a precursor to this, Yehoshua said that Yehoshua said that you are known by the fruit you produce. And this is, we're dealing with Jamal Bryant and these other men who are saying that open marriages was okay and all the kinds of nonsense in the church. I made a proclamation in the first part that I would not stand by Jamal Bryant. He doesn't represent me and I will have nothing to do with him unless I speak to him in person or I hear him repent. No more. One person says I'm still freezing. Is that correct? Is that happening? Okay, so Annie Sharma, you need to go and call out a return. It may be the house that you're in in New Jersey. <laughs> okay, good. So we're now in Matthew 12, 34. Matthew 12, 34. Yehoshua speaking. Listen to his language. And Christians today, Christians today, I always talk in, 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 in unfiltered comments. Christians today, or quotation marks, are saying, uh, you shouldn't speak to people using harsh words. And again, that's what you would find with these people. You will find Jakes and Bryant and Austin and all these people. They never have a sharp rebuke for anybody. Nobody. There's no sharp rebuke from their lips. You don't hear it. The, I mean, the worst could be happening. And there's no sharp rebuke. At least they don't do it publicly. And with all the sin I see in, I'm seeing in the church and in the USA and the North, by now you should be hearing something. Oh yes, Joel smiled for everything and has said it clearly that he does not have the assignment to speak about sin. That's what I heard him say. There's not here say. That's what I heard him say. He doesn't have the responsibility. That's other people's jobs. His job is to make people feel better about themselves. Those were his words. And yet he inspires people. It's on YouTube. Find it. It's right there. I'm not, this is a public, public information. Joel Austin said it's not his job to preach against sin. It's his job to make people feel better. What does that mean? How do I make you feel better? He said, because there are too many things happening in the world today, how can I just go tell you about sin? That's not my job. Indeed, so I, 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 I don't spend two minutes watching him. I do not even spend two minutes listening to Joel Austin. I have ceased listening to T.D. Jakes. I no longer hear them. Why? Because they do not address anything that is pertinent to getting home to glory. Our aspiration should be to live with Messiah or to be prepared for his return. Not to fit into the world. My assignment is to preach to you to understand that if you do not live right, you would not see him on that day. If you die tonight and you don't live right, you would not be raised on that day. That's my job. My job is to inspect the church, churches, plural, not just core ministries international, all of them. Because he said to me in Ephesians 4, I was given to the body, not to a building. I was given to the body. And I will inspect every church, whether you like it or not, I will tell you of your sin. Because if you have the spirit, you repent. If you don't, you just manifest who you are, who's inside of you. I don't, I don't have restraint when it comes to that. And a son of mine was talking to me today. I said to him, if, if I were on that show, I would rebuke Jamal Bryan publicly, on television. I'd shout from, they have to put me out. That's how sick in my mind people think I am nowadays. And they said it. Oh, you sick. Yeah, maybe I am. Because I'll rebuke you anywhere. I don't play with that. You would not be insulting my father in heaven. Don't use his name. Don't use his name if you cannot live up to what it is. If you cannot represent his name correctly, I shall deal with you. Oh yeah, commercial break. 
they'll flip the switch quickly and say, please leave. And I'll still preach when the switch goes off. There are too many scary cats holding Bibles in their hands. Warriors carry swords. Don't hold the sword if you're scared to talk. But there are too many bedroom warriors hiding. I told one that I said, you can't talk to me. You have the most things to say, but in private. You say nothing publicly against sin. But you have all the courage. Courageous people don't hide on the rocks. Courageous people do not hide on the rocks. They come out and if they ha their blood is shed, let it be shed. You can't love the Lord so much and have this insult consistently being made against him and we're quiet about it. Because pastor will come into the office on Sunday and say, why did you talk like that? Or if you're an Adventist, they come into the church on Saturday and they say, why I'm seeing you on Facebook having all these comments and being so aggressive? You shouldn't be like that. Yes, I should be like that. More than that, pastor, why are you so quiet? You the shepherd of the flock and you can't talk yet? Some of you are too scared. You the shepherd of this church and you, we can't hear your voice? These men are after money. Bottom line. You cannot serve God and mammon and they've tried it. How can you save someone's souls if you act like that? Oh my God, thank you so much, Miss Grenville. Blessings on you so much. Exactly the point. How can you save someone's soul if you act as if they don't need a change? If nobody tells you of the danger of sin, you think it's all right. God's going to hold some of these men accountable. I'm telling you all, I would not be one of them. I can't take that risk. He's a celebrity preacher. You cannot take that risk. You can listen to me. If you love somebody for real, tell them that their soul is in danger. The more they could do stop talking to you. That's all they'll do. I have had people who walked away from me because I told them you cannot, you cannot continue in sin. Not around me. I've told them that. Not around me. I told the church, not in here. This person will not lead in here. Not as long as I'm living. And you behaving like that? Not in here. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. What will I do? I get, away, get rid of the leaven. Only this evening, my sister said to me, boy, I can relate. She said they don't understand. I showed her the video of Jamal Bryant and John Gray tolerating Monique and her husband about open sex with anybody else. She said they don't understand why you're so angry, Nigel. Can they see why you're so angry with the churches nowadays? What would Yeshua have done? When he went to the temple, all they were doing is simply selling turtle doves and exchanging money. That's all. And he got a cord and sat dealing with them. You could imagine if they were having fornication and adultery in the church like some of these preachers do nowadays. What he would have done to them? How could the fire, the scripture says he fulfilled scripture? They're on the show because they are facilitators. They're good enough to be on these shows. All for ratings. Jamal Bryant and these men would fit in any circle. And I'm going to make this tonight very clear again. A hypocrite is the only person that could fit in every circle. A hypocrite is defined by me. Holy Spirit told me that. He said, a hypocrite is known by being able to fit in every circle. That's a hypocrite. You fit anywhere without being condemned by anyone. No, you fit, a hypocrite fits anywhere without being opposed by anybody. So let's, let's pick up the text again. Verse 34 of Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 34. Listen to the words of Yehoshua. Offspring, generation of vipers, that's what he call them. So these guys who tell me you shouldn't speak rough to people, I'm following Yeshua. He said, you generation of vipers, or you children of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? How? Listen to Yeshua's question and then they know the answer. How could you evil men speak what is right? 
This is what Yehoshua told the Pharisees. He said, you generation of vipers, how could you being evil speak good things? How? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man out of the good treasures of his mind will speak good things. And the evil man out of the evil treasures of his mind will say what's evil. Jamal Bryant, when he said that he was always in favor of having an open marriage. Yes, Miss Grenville, they have blood in their hands. They have blood on their hands and I will not have any on mine. A preach, we in Matthew 10, verse number 34, um, Umadeli. Matthew 12, sorry. Matthew 12, 34. Matthew 12, 34. And I'll read it again for you. Matthew 12, 34. Yehoshua says, you offspring of vipers, how can you being evil speak anything that's good? We, we, make, we make that demand on these people. <laughs> we try to get evil preachers to preach what is right. I've even stopped trying to rebuke them because I realize it doesn't make sense. An evil person cannot say what is good, period. If you're not born again, you can't change the language. He said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they cast out devils. They speak with new languages. If you are not born again, you would not speak what is right. And these preachers are not born again. Yehoshua said, how can an evil person say what is good? Jamal Bryant is saying that it's okay. He was always in favor of an open marriage, which is him being married to one woman and having sex with other people. He was always in favor with that, but he didn't tell his wife. That's what he said this week. He was always in favor of it, but he never told his wife. So what makes him different now when he doesn't have a wife? Why even bother to marry? But even if you're single and you're sleeping around, it's still fornication. And you're still lost. People follow them, yes, because they're, they're inspirational. They're full of words. They're full of words. As Ruth rightly said, what is inspiration? Inspire me to do what? An inspirational preacher inspires me to do what? Why I'm waiting for Jamal. When I see, I sat at dinner with this man. And if I see him again, if I see him again in person, oh, it's going, it's going, it will, it's going down. It will, be, it will go down between two. Like Paul did to Peter, I rebuke him before everybody at the dinner table. I rebuke him without even winking. And I wouldn't eat. That would be the sign. I don't want your food. I sat at dinner with this man before. And if I do it again, I'll rebuke him publicly. I don't know if he has the spirit of truth in him. Matthew 12, 4, 35 now. 35. The good man, out of the abundance of his heart, he would speak that which is good. The evil man out of the evil treasure of his mind will put forth evil things. That's what he'll do. He can't do better. But I say to you, says Yeshua, that every idle word, whatever man may speak, they shall give an account of it in the judgment day. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's scripture. He said on that day, Whatever you said, idle words, there was no motion to it, there was no life to those words. He said, I'll deal with you for it. Idle doesn't mean casual conversation. Look at the context that he spoke it in. When evil men speak, he said, I'm going to judge you on that day for your words that you say. Because you speak things that appear to have life, but death is all, all over it. You talk about godliness, but you're ungodly in every way. Idle words. You speak about revival, but everybody's dead. Idle words. Deception indeed. Idle words. No life comes out of it. And he said, I'm going to deal with you all for that. Yeah, the same loving Jesus that you talk about. He said, I'll deal with them for that. Yehoshua doesn't play. I don't know who, who, who knows him well. He doesn't tolerate sin. He never did. He came to get people out of sin. He died so they could get out of sin. That's what he did. He didn't come to tolerate sin. He came to get persons out of sin. The bondage of it. That was his assignment. 
So, so when he sat with the wine bibbers, as they call, and the tax collectors, he didn't sit to encourage them in their sin. He sat to present his righteousness to them. A sinner should never come before you as a Christian, as a saint. A sinner should never come before you to find comfort in their sin. They always, the, sinners don't come to me for approval. They come to me for life. Saying, I need to say, I need to be saved. I need to change. I want to be different because I heard you preaching and I want to change. That's what sinners do with me. I don't know about anybody else. Persons from across this country calling me on television. Sir, I need your help. I have a problem. I heard you preach and I don't want to go to hell. And the wicked, evil, evil, carnal vipers are saying, Nigel London, stop that. The, the, you, you're not preaching right. You, you're preaching too aggressively. Um, you're hurting the church. Really? Really? So why are sinners on the outside saying they want to get saved when they hear me speak? Why are sinners saying we want to get saved? We don't want to die. We don't want to go to hell. Why are they saying that? I'm not hurting the church. I'm exposing the wickedness in these preachers. I am saying to you tonight, by the grace of Jehovah, I'm saying to you without... Please hear me. I'm telling you this in all honesty. I have in all my life, since the Lord has graced me with this apostolic calling, he said, wake up and I receive this gift. Everyone who has wanted to be saved have come to me saying, what must I do to be saved? Or, sir, I need to be saved. I want to be baptized. I heard you preach and I, need, I know I have to change. I never had any altar call. Oh, y'all, come here. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, I beg you, come tonight. Please come for salvation. I don't do that. When I preach, persons respond by saying, I need to be saved. On the day of Pentecost, which is the beginning of the church era, in reference to multiplication, when Peter got through preaching, he didn't give an altar call. The crowd said, what must I do? What must we do? Tell us what to do. They didn't say, Peter didn't say, come on, I beg you, please. I beg of you, please, come on, please, I beg you, please. Do you see any doctor opening the office doors with a, with a bullhorn? Please, I beg you, come, come, please. I ask you to come today, please. Um, I know that you have AIDS or you're dying. I beg of you, please, man. I don't want you to die. Please come to my office. Do you see doctors doing that? The doctor's office is closed. You find them when you're sick. Or you make a house call and he comes to your house. Because you are the sick one. The sinner is the sick person. They need help. I am telling you this and I make a report tonight publicly. Across the world, wherever this broadcast is going. I have always had people contact me to say, we want to be saved. Sir, please pray with me now. I would like to be saved. And I said, I have to pray with you, dear heart. You just, or sir, you believe. Believe and confess, which is to make a proclamation of Yahushua. You not repeat after me. It's to make a proclamation by your life that he is Lord. That's the confession me. Then me, oh God, uh, um, sir, um, I repeat after me, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I come tonight, I come tonight. That is not a prayer of salvation. That's a prayer of mimicking. You're mimicking what I say. You're mocking my statement. You are imitating my statement. When the jailer asked the Apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? What did he say? Believe and you shall be saved. You and your household. He didn't say repeat after me. When the people asked Peter on the day of Pentecost, what must we do to be saved? What Peter said, repent and turn from their wicked ways and be baptized. Isn't that what he said? He didn't say repeat after me. All of you, 3,000 people, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I come tonight, I come tonight in need of a Savior. Peter never said that. Never said that. When Philip met the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch who was reading, he said, how could I understand if nobody teaches me? Philip taught him the word. You know what he said next? I want me baptized. Look water right there. Baptize me now. The, you, the Philip didn't say, please repeat after me, my brother. I want you to be saved. No. There is no scripture that says anybody repeats anything for salvation. Confession is made unto salvation. Oh my God, El, you, you just, you, you're going to make me get started tonight now. Listen to me. Listen to me, please. Listen to me, please. 
if I call 50 people, 50 people to the altar, it doesn't mean there are 50 souls being saved. There are 50 people responding to what I said, which is come here, let me pray with you all to be saved. I have seen as a preacher for over 20 plus years I've been preaching. So I'm, I'm not trying to figure out what I'm doing here tonight. There's no novice before you. I have stood and seen in church when I'm preaching. People, mothers telling them, go to that altar, go on, go on and get saved. Duh, how could you force a child to go to the altar and you call that salvation? I have seen mothers threaten their children, get up and go to this altar. And when I saw that, Holy Spirit said, cut this off. Cut it off. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you for being honest, my dear heart. Holy Spirit said, cut it out. Whoever hears me, he said, whoever hears him will respond by seeking you out or somebody around and say, what must I do to be saved? One time, the jailer didn't come to rededicate his life. The jailer was changed. Lydia and her entire house was changed. People seek me out. Persons from the USA, persons from Guyana, persons from all over the world. Say, sir, I'm watching your broadcast. I watch your YouTube video. I want to be saved. They, they find me everywhere I am. I need to be changed. Why do they say that? I don't have a, a counter. I'm about to mess up some preachers tonight right here. And I have a pen and a paper recording. Okay, um, all right. We got, we got 50 souls today. Um, see, see, me, see me the pen and the, and the paper. Um, we have 50 souls tonight. Woo! We have 45 tonight. Let's keep counting now. We have 200. Wow! We have 2,000. Man, I'm an evangelist. No, you're not. Because of those who walk to the altar, how do you know they're saved? And if they are saved, why do they go back out into the world and continue in sin until the next crusade is called or the next revival comes? Why do they wait for another year to come back to be revived and to be reborn to be resaved, you better cut that foolishness out. A saved person has been salvaged from sin. Salvation, how do I know they're saved? Their behavior changes. Their, be, their conduct changes. If any man be in Yeshua, he is a new person. New person. That's salvation. Not coming to the altar. If there's no change of conduct, there's no change of life. You have not changed. That's salvation. New, 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 new. You're not old. Old behavior is old. You, you're still lost. You just fooled the preacher and made the preacher feel good because he went to the altar. I've had children who I used to teach in school. They would tell me every year, a pastor, pastor, sir, sir, Mr. London, we have, they call it crusade or, or convention. We have convention tonight. I'm going to get saved at convention. Every year for 10 years, 5 years, 4 years. Same thing. Every annual convention, the same children get saved. And I tell them all the time, I said, you're not saved. You just want to make the preacher feel good. Because when you come to school, I see your conduct. You're not changed. You're not different. You're the same person. When I see change, I call it salvation. Thank you, Father. When I see change, I call that salvation. Not when I see altar call. When I see change, I call it salvation. When I see change, I call it salvation. Not when I see altar calls. When I see change, I call it salvation. In the absence of change, you are lost. Go to the altar 50 times, I still call you lost. And that's why preachers get upset with me. Because the apostles never did what we try to do today. Never once. Full of words, man. They talk you up to an altar. People, with a, a good speaker, a good speaker, a good orator could speak to you and make you run to an altar tonight. Run, like run like crazy. I want to be saved, I want to be saved. But you're not changed. 
You just heard a stirring message and it felt good. First of all, church, I said church, Periscope Church, <laughs> please hear me, please hear me. There was no church building when the apostles were preaching, therefore there could be no altar call. There was no church building. They moved from house to house and even the jailer was saved in the prison. In the prison. There was no church building. Yokanan the baptized to preach repentance in the wilderness. Your whole show preacher coming down from a mountain and through the streets of, the, of his town. We began to build structures, have a, 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 a 10 foot space by 50 feet or 25 feet, whatever it is. And then they say, this is an altar. This is where you get saved. No, this is where they walk to show the church that they are responding to a call. But no man is changed by responding to a call. That is not a mark of the change. Let me, let me phrase it that way. Because some persons are genuinely changed when they move. But not everyone is. You don't know that. There you go. I was safe in my bedroom. Somebody just said it. Somebody just said it. Some were saved in jail cells. Some were saved in an accident. Some were saved in, in, in a hotel room somewhere by themselves. Some were saved leaving somebody's house after they sinned. And they got it in their head that if you don't change now, I'm going to kill you. That's right, Miss Grenville. I'm so grateful for your comment. You, you speak. I'm so happy. To, I could see change in you right here. I could see the Lord is touching you right here. I, I'm, I love it. Thank you for responding. There are many people who have congregational interest. Or it should be financial interest, not congregational interest. They have financial interest, so money... If I speak like Nigel London, I lose money. I don't lose anything. So let me just make that very clear to you. I am a witness to the fact that persons ask me every time, what must I do to be saved? Or, sir, I need to be saved. Or, sir, I want to be baptized. I've heard you speaking. The Lord has spoken to me. I felt convicted. I want to change. Every time, everywhere I go, it happens. And I have never had cause to tell them, please come. I beg you to come. Never did. And I never will. Because Yehoshua said, if my spirit, true J, I don't know, okay, you're one of those persons. I'm not, I like Periscope because I don't see persons' names. But you said you're one of those persons. I appreciate that because you're a witness. Persons say, I want to be different. I want to, I've heard the message. I want to change. While others are saying, you shouldn't preach like this. So why would true J say they want to change then? That's correct. You hear the word, conviction comes to the mind, then you change behavior. You hear the word, conviction comes by Holy Spirit, of course, then you change behavior. That's what salvation is. You confess, you believe, you proclaim Him to be Lord. You acknowledge that you've sinned. You don't need me to do that. The message He preaches to you should tell you that you sinned. And you can't live like this. A guy, someone once asked, a, a preacher, a guy asked me, saying, listen man, um, I'm homosexual. Do you think God will save me? I said, he would save you, but he wouldn't save you as one, doing this all the time. You have to change. You have to stop. Because the scripture said, no homosexual will inherit the kingdom. Bless you, bless you. Oh good, you're on the prayer line. Wonderful, my sister Anne. May the Lord use you tonight and speak through you. Amen. Let's go further now. Let's go deeper here. We had verse number... 38, Matthew 12, 38, Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said, Teacher, we want to see a sign. And you know what he said? He said, a wicked and perverse generation wants a sign. But you'll have no sign but that of, of, of Jonah. He said, that's all the sign you're going to get. For three days and three nights. That's Easter right there before your Easter talk, Easter Christians. Hear it again. Three days and three nights can never be Friday to Sunday before the sun comes up. For three days and three nights, the Son of Man shall be in the belly of the heart of the earth. He said, that's all the signs I'll show you all. No more. That doesn't mean no signs will be done by the hands of apostles. He said to them, to that generation, 
those who ask the question, that's all you will see. I'm showing you nothing else because he did many more signs and wonders with other people, but he said not y'all. Let's go to Matthew 12, 41. Matthew 12, 41. Men, here Yeshua speaking, Ninevites, here is language. Ninevites will stand up in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. Most of you had stopped reading, so you didn't read all this. So let me make you aware of it. Yehoshua said, Yehoshua said, Ninevites, the people of Nineveh, who Jonah went to preach to, will get up and will condemn you all. I want America to hear me and North America to hear me clearly here. He said, Nineveh will get up and will condemn you. Why? Because Jonah preached. Jonah preached and they repented. There's Yeshua's words, it's in red in your Bible. He said, Jonah preached in Nineveh. And Nineveh repented. But you wouldn't change. So the Ninevites will condemn you. To let you know that you had truth right before you. And you couldn't change. We change. You didn't. You did not. And there are too many people in the church in North America. Who are having truth every week. Hundreds of messages. And they refuse to turn. And you will, the, the poorer nation. Who have repented will be the ones who will judge you on that day. That's book right here. That's scripture. They will judge the north. They will judge Europe. And say you've had more technology than us. You've had more benefits than us. You've seen more goodness than us. You've had more health than us. You've had more blessings than us. And you refuse to turn. He said Nineveh will condemn you on the day of judgment. What does that mean? The testimony of Nineveh will turn against the, the, those men. Verse number 42. He said, because the greater one than Jonah is right here. And you don't want to listen to him. Verse 42. The queen of the south, with is Sheba, will be raised in the judgment in this genera with this generation and will condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And you don't want to hear him either. That's Yeshua telling them. There are too many witnesses against you. Verse 43. Now we get to the depth of depth. This right here. I pray you could really last tonight. And receive this by the grace of the Lord. From verse 43. Matthew 12 from verse 43. Let's, let's do this. But when. Listen to how Yeshua functions. He begins, he talks about Nineveh will, con will condemn you, Sheba will condemn you, and just like that, listen to his language. When the unclean spirits go out from a man, listen to his language, Look, listen to how he just started talking now, listen to him. When the unclean spirit, because you remember before that he cast the spirit out of somebody, and they said that the person is, was on my Beelzebub, okay. So he said, when an unclean spirit goes out from a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest. He doesn't go to hell. He goes to dry places seeking rest. That's scripture. And does not find it. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came out. And coming, he finds it standing empty. The word empty is the word skolazo in Greek. It means to take a holiday. It means to be at leisure. The spirit finds a person at leisure, just relaxing. Taking a holiday. They're not on assignment then. And that's just what happened to these preachers. They're on assignment. They're, they're not on assignment. They're just resting. Because the assignment is to preach righteousness, to preach Messiah and Him crucified. Paul said, I desire to know nothing more about, among you but Messiah and him crucified. Oh, but these preachers are on leisure. They, oh yeah, they're leisure time. They would, tr they, would, they would lay right out on the jet and they'll be on the beaches and they'll be just relaxing. They have no assignment. They don't, they don't be awakened to sin. They don't be awakened to preach against sin. They are at leisure. They just live the life. They live it up. Millionaires. He said, when the demon comes back and find that you are taking a holiday from your assignment, what else? And the house is swept. It is clean now. 
There's nobody in it. Mm. The house is swept. It means to be clean. There's no one at home. You don't have Holy Ghost then. Holy Ghost is out. He's not in the house. When the spirit comes back, he finds the house is uninhabited. It, the, pers the person has no commitment to being different. Empty. Watch this now. And decorated. Decorated. Yeshua's words. The word decorated is the word cosmia, which is where you get the word cosmetic from. Cosmetic. Remember cosmetics? Right. It means to be attractive or appealing. When the spirit comes back, yes, they find the preacher in the robe and the mitre, the staff, the rings and the, 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 the beautiful look. Oh my God, this man is so impressive. They are attractive. They look pretty. The demon says, you are ready for my habitation because I have seven more worse than myself to come inside. Listen to the words of Yeshua. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more evil than himself. I'm getting to the point right here. And the last things of that man become worse than the first. He is worse of them before. Listen to what the church has missed. So it will be to also, so it will be also to this evil generation. That's the part that most people have missed. So, okay, it will be exactly the same with this generation. What is he saying here? What is Yeshua telling us? Let me break it down for you. That the generation that we see now, he said in, in the north, in America and in, in, in Canada, they were once free. That's why you will always say the same things to me, apostle. These men didn't start out like that. Exactly. They were once free. But the demons came back and found that they were uninhabited. They were pretty, but empty. They're influential, but they don't have Holy Ghost. Romans 8 says, if you don't have his spirit, you are not of him. Whoever continues in sin, Yochanan said, don't have him. And these men like Jamal Bryant, who have continued to sin, are inhabitable for demons. He said, America, your churches were once free. Most of them, there was a revival in your land and you were once free. But now, most, the vast majority, the greater part of them have gotten possessed. Hear ye the word. They have gotten possessed. These men did not start like this. But something happened and nobody, very few persons caught a whim of it. What happened was, those who were once preachers of righteousness have subtly twisted, have subtly changed to unrighteousness. And you didn't even realize it happened before your eyes. Some of you slept through the whole ordeal. But I pray that your eyes are open today and that this message cause you to realize how much trouble is before the church she is in trouble the church in the north is in danger because she's not measuring men by righteousness she's measuring them by influence she's not measuring men by righteousness she's measuring them by influence bless you reg she's not measuring men by righteousness she's measuring them by influence i said to you again she is not measuring men by righteousness. She's judging them by influence. Because she finds these preachers resting from their assignment. Resting from their assignment. That's what they're doing. The house is empty. It is swept. Empty means you're at leisure. You're not working. And a person who is graced to work and takes a back seat from their assignment because they're living with sin that person is full of demons you are open to possession wholesale America needs to repent and she would not do it that's the sad part 
The Lord made it very clear to me, and I believe when he speaks to me. He said, America shall not repent. She will not. He said there will be a remnant in the land, but the masses wouldn't. You hear every other prophet, every other prophet could tell you what they want to say. I'll tell you what he told me in his word. He said, because the days will be worse. He said, I will, never re I will never change my prophetic utterances for no one. He said he will never change his prophetic word for anybody. In the last days, it will be worse. These are the last days. He said, America will not repent. And he said to me today that the churches, the local assemblies with crosses on them, he said, they are the ones. They are the ones that are responsible for the demise of that nation. Not the sinners. It's those with crosses in front. He said, you are the ones who will be responsible for the demise of this nation. She is lost. There's no repentance. America will not repent. A few people will, but America is not repenting. Not repenting. Holy Spirit said to me for the past few days, I said to my wife, girlfriend, I keep hearing this. I told my children, I said, I keep hearing this. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. He said that to me at least three times, definitively. And the next day he said it three times. He keeps keep singing in threes. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. And he stops talking. I wake up the next day, he comes back. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. And I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you all. He said, Hillary is the worst. That's all he keeps telling me. Hillary is the worst. You have a woman possessed by demons. It's one thing to be, to be possessed by ego. It's another thing to be possessed by demons. Trump is possessed by ego. Clinton is possessed by demons. And the church doesn't know the difference. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Hear ye the word of the hear the word of the Lord. A man possessed by ego is a lot safer to deal with than a one possessed by demons. Demons don't die. They last for ages until they're destroyed by the, or they're put in the lake of fire. And they don't die either. They just be there for eternity. They have gone through ages, eons of evil. They are axes of evil. They know evil. They transition through centuries, through uh, civilizations, just in different forms. They've just passed through. Hillary Clinton is possessed by ancient demons. You will see it. And if I leave this earth before you, you remember these words tonight. You will not forget this. Because this is stored information. And evidence will speak. The Lord says to me three times, Hillary is evil. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. And when he speaks to me like that, I don't miss him. I'm warning the church. I'm warning the church. How could Bernie Sanders be so sure that this woman and her husband were responsible for so many thousands of jobs being lost in Detroit and leaving the U.S.? And now he flips his script and goes right back to bow to her. And you could see that day when he stood before Hillary. Hillary had a, pos a, a, a control over, over Bernie. She had a dominant spirit over Bernie. There's a, a, an ancient demon has possessed that woman. You will see it. You will never forget these words tonight. Wow. One of her emails said that she had to sacrifice chicken to Moloch. There you go. I, did, I don't know that. I have no clue about this. But the Lord is speaking. The, and Moloch is an ancient God. You find him in, way back in the Old Testament. That's the evidence. The Holy Spirit doesn't lie to me. I don't know about any, not any other preacher. He doesn't lie to Nigel London. Never will. She frequents Haiti. Okay. 
out of the mouth of two or three. I'm telling you what he told me, he said, Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. And I'm going to make this clear to you all tonight so you can understand even further by the Spirit of the Lord. The reason why he said she has, she has, she has gotten such 97% or 93% of the Latinos and the blacks who are Democrats support Hillary. Doesn't that sound strange to you? How could someone who put you in prison attract you so much? It is not Hillary. It is not her. It is not her. It's an ancient demon. I prophesy by the Spirit of the Lord that your children are in trouble because of this woman. You will see it. You will see it in the education system. You see it in the legal system. You see it in the penal system. And you will know it's true. You will know that this word of prophecy was true. This woman, the Lord said to me clearly, clearly, that because the preachers, I didn't say preachers of righteousness, because the preachers are possessed, they will have a ruler that is possessed also. And that's why I told you, you, are, you have a catch-22 coming your way. Because Donald is possessed by ego. Hillary is possessed by demons. Both are possessed people and none have the spirit of God on them. Not one of them. His spirit is not on them. Not even on to say in. He said, I, I have removed my hand from these people. But I'll direct their mind to discipline the church. You'll see it. You'll see it. You will see it. Either way, you'll see it. But he kept telling me Hillary is the worst. And I believe what he's saying to me. Hillary is, you hear many times I say that to you? That's just what he's been doing to me. I can't rest. I cannot rest. All he keeps pouring in my spirit is Hillary is the worst. Hillary is the worst. This is about demonic possession. These preachers before you, many of them are possessed by demons. That's why, as well, they would refuse to have me go to preach in the churches. Because demons know. Demons know that if apostles, and not just me, but other people, they know that if true apostles show up, they'll be exposed and they'll be cast out. So the demons are influencing the preachers. They don't let them come, but they can't stop it. If the Lord wants to deliver one of those men, I promise you that the true apostle will find him. Or a prophet. Or one whoever is true of the Lord will find them and they'll be delivered. But he said to me, they were once free. They were once free of whatever evil, unclean spirit had possessed them. But the spirit came back and found them to be empty and attractive, decorated. They were decorated with power. They were decorated with influence. And therefore, the level of demonic warfare increased in their life, and they cannot deal with it. They can't resist now. He said, for some of these men, they cannot even resist what is happening to them. They can speak no differently. They have been possessed. Dewey Smith has gone off. I, he, you better pray he repents. The moment Dewey Smith said, but about homosexuals and everybody else, if you eat crawfish, you're just like homosexual, God said, I've dealt with that man. And you see now where he is? He's gone, he gone to the so-called preachers now, with Jamal Brandt and those, because he is running after money. His church is in debt, heavy debt, and he wants to get out. He's chasing the dollar, and he slipped from his message. That man was a profound preacher, but he's lost hope. He's lost sight of the bark. Shalom to you tonight. Thank you for your time. I shall say no more than he tells me to say. Shalom. Thank you, Daddy. I receive it. Thank you so much, Daddy. Shalom. Thank you for the second part. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your input. And I praise the Lord to know that we had no trolls and these crazy people on. I guess they're being warned. Shalom. Love you, Mary. Love you all so much. Love all of you. My father's children, blessings to you. Praise Adonai. See you again. Remember on Friday what we do. Friday, 7.30, we're on television. I say we. I just feel as if you all are such a part of, of what I do, and I really appreciate that. All right? Uh, I will see next president, Mary. Well, let's see. The Lord knows, baby. Um, on Friday at 7.30, we're live on television. Please vote, uh, uphold me in prayer. That's all I ask of you. Friday television. Miss Grenville, thank you so much for joining us. I call you Grenville. It's Granville, huh? Sorry about that. Uh, so, Shalom.
Thank you. Blessings and goodbye.